Well, no, I think the first thing we should do, Glenn and I, is... Glenn and I go back a long way, actually. I just realised something, that um, a long, long time ago, before Glenn was um, running Mama, he used to, you know, be a great scholar, still is, no doubt, of Islamic art. That's right. And, and I think probably four decades ago, just over the horizon, I used to, in the, my days at the v and also edited a learned journal, it's all, all history now, of course, called Oriental Art, and Glenn used to write articles. Yeah. We both moved on. We both moved on. I've just been trying to keep up with him, which is <laughs> really difficult. <laughs> anyway, I'm very worried about that hat girl. No, but no, 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 don't take it. Um, but the first thing we should do is, is to applaud Naomi and her... Her constant innovation. Uh, she is the, she is the mover and shaker par excellence, and um, I think uh, Melbourne should be very proud of the fact. We are I extremely envious of the fact that there's no Naomi Milgram in Sydney. We have the other half, of course. We have the other half. Uh, we have we have John. <laughs> yeah, beat that. Yeah. Um, so. But anyway, this is such a wonderful, wonderful thing to do. And we all know, okay, it's, it's inspired by what happens at the, uh, the Serpentine Gallery in London with their, their annual architectural design element. But, you know, it takes real initiative and imagination and drive to make these things happen. And I, I think this is what Naomi's done is wonderful. And, and Sean is here, Sean Godson is here who's done the first one, and I was popping down having a look the other day, so immediately they started doing this, and this went up, and that went down, and, um, and Sean's just said he still doesn't know how to draw a curved line, and I looked up here and I said, no, that's correct, <laughs> uh, but nonetheless, what a, what a wonderful thing to do about. But I thought we'd start, because here we are in a piece of well, design and architecture, which is fundamentally impermanent. And I think we all tend to think of architecture as rather permanent. Um, maybe we thought of art as rather permanent. We now know that art can be very temporary with, with installations, performance, and everything else under the sun. So the notion of permanency is perhaps being challenged, and maybe it's even being challenged in, in architecture as well. I don't know what uh, Den thinks about this, but it was one of the things that was on my mind is architecture as permanent? Is it the great sort of legacy, material legacy, that uh, you know that us sentient beings have left on the planet? Sick transit, Gloria Mundi. Uh, you know, some architecture certainly survives, yeah. but it, there's nothing. There's no guarantee. There's no reason why we have to think of architecture as being any more permanent or impermanent than anything else. We just have this strange sense that if you build something it's going to be there forever but very little really survives that long. I, actually, I don't know whether any of you have read a series of essays by uh, Pierre Wigmans. Has anybody read it? Under this, he don't, I think it's under the nom de plume of Simon Lays. You, Bill, you have done it. <laughs> Made everything for God's sake. Um, but uh, has anybody seen the, the book called The Hall of Uselessness? It's a wonderful title. It's actually taken from a, a Taoist text written in the third century BC called Guangzhou. At the end of the fourth chapter, there's a, a line that says that everybody knows the value of what is useful, but nobody understands the value of what is useless. And uh, uh, that's where Rickman's took the title, but he writes an essay about the Chinese sense of antiquity. And it's very interesting because, you know, um, he says, in the West, in our tradition, we, you know, our sense of antiquity resides in buildings, in pyramids, in Renaissance palaces, and things like that, which, uh, which is, you know, it's probably true. But he said in, in China, of course, it doesn't. Actually, architecture is, is actually very transient there. It's a completely different kind of aspect, a completely different uh, value to architecture. Reminds me of an anecdote. Uh, Philippe de Montebello, who was the legendary 
uh, and longtime director of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. He was in the middle of a fundraising campaign, and he had a donor uh, with him, and they were walking through the galleries, and he found a space that the donor very much wanted, and they talked about how much it would cost to have the space named uh, in the donor's honor, and uh, the donor said, well, you know, uh, if I put my name up there, uh, how long will it be there for? And Philippe <laughs> said, oh, in perpetuity. And the donor said, how long is that? And Philippe said, for you, about 25 years. <laughs> you know, it's all relative. It's actually, all relative. Yes, it is relative. And, that, and that's something actually that's, that comes up in, you know, in your world, in, the, in my previous world, when, when people, um, you know, about how, how, how long indeed is, is, uh, is uh, immortality. Immortality is, has got a, a short life sometimes as well. But this business about um, you know the the, the 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 legacy of architecture uh, to us it is a it is a it's, I think in my when I look around I think that architecture is is really the most permanent of legacies. But this idea about you know the experience of architecture that we see here in, in, in something like Sean's building here, um, which we know is impermanent. I mean, is that a is that an acceptable fact? Can we can we deal? Can we get our heads around the fact that architecture can be as transient? I think so. I mean, there's an awful lot of architecture if you look around the world that was never meant to be permanent, right? You think of the dwellings in Africa that are incredibly beautiful. Uh, some of the work of Hassan Fatih in Egypt, a great uh, Egyptian modernist, that were built with very simple, humble materials. That, we're not meant to be permanent. Take a look at most of your buildings here in Melbourne. You know, are they going to be here in 50 years? Probably well, not. Well, a lot of people hope they won't. <laughs> <laughs> no. So, I, you know, and I'm very intrigued with the temporary, the idea of doing something knowing that it, it, it isn't freighted with all of the responsibilities of having to be permanent. And I think, especially when you're dealing with institutions that change and grow, uh, architecture has to have a certain elasticity to it. Uh, you think about some of the things that we do cherish, right? The Eiffel Tower, that great monument. It was never meant to be permanent. Maybe Sean's Pavilion will end up yeah. like the Eiffel yeah. Tower. It was supposed to be up for a World's Fair one year. Take it down. Yeah. Of course, the French being the French, they couldn't do that. Uh, and it still dominates uh, the Parisian skyline. But So, you know, where's where's the line between something that was intended to be temporary, that everybody loves, and becomes, it stays? Becomes permanent. Mm -hmm. and but the something. question about buildings um, and structures and architecture evolving is another thing altogether. That's about it actually changing its function, perhaps, mm -hmm. changing its role. Adapting. Mm -hmm. And adapting to, to new times and, and, new, and new situations. And buildings can do that. I mean, this is something which you know, anybody involving, involved with, with a, a kind of institution like, like uh, Glenn is, and like I was, you know, these, we were involved with, with, with institutions which by their very nature have got to continue to grow and evolve or change. Well, and when the minute you do that, you realize that architecture is going to both be an enabler, but also on occasion uh, a victim. Uh, if you want to look at it that way, of someone else's um, new ideas. But I, I think it's, you know, permanence has a kind of uh, presumption to it that maybe my generation finds very difficult that you can make the claim that anything has a right to be permanent. Uh, I think of a great deal of what we do as being transitory. You, you, you do it move on, it has a life, it ceases to exist. I, I mean, to me, the, the sense of the transitory is in, uh, gathering at an increasing pace, that's all. I think, I think we're, you know, our sense of change and needing change is something that is, uh, as I say, is gathering pace. And I think of, well, you're all too old, but, you know, the next generation is so ADD <laughs> that, you know, it can't deal with anything that's uh, static. Yeah. And that applies to, to, to design and architecture as well. I think so. I mean, it's just like the art world. I mean, the, the, I mean we'll come and talk about art museums, but one of the things that strikes me very strongly, and this, I know you've been talking about this, and we'll, we'll talk about it again, is how the, you know, the art institution, or the, the modern art institution, is, is gradually changing from a place of passivity to a place of activity. 
and, and you know, that is a, a, yeah, it's a considerable shift. Um, I hope it's not going to delete you know, the, the, the contemplated role that they have as well. But nonetheless, it does mean that there's, there's, there's a complete shift. And you, you've been building, you know, and you know exactly, exactly what that means. But well, let's come back again to, 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 the, you know, to the function as well. I mean, architecture, there's a quote. I, I just found this. I found this in a book. I'm going to read some to you, excuse me. Because um, most architects, I thought, would hate this. Um, this was Adolf Loos, who wrote this presumably in the 1930s or thereabouts. You know the architect? He said, I saw this on the airplane this morning. Only a very small part of architecture belongs to art, the tomb and the monument. Everything else that fulfills a function is to be excluded from the domain of art. Which I find an extraordinary thing to say, wouldn't you? Don't say that to Frank Gehry. No, no. But I mean, say that to any architect. I mean, the idea that there's no art, uh, you know, and the, that function um, deletes art, what an extraordinary thing to say, isn't it? This is this is one of your your fellow architects who said this. I prefer the description of architecture from Berlin Architecture, where he talks about art entering into architecture. Yeah. A building's a technical act. Um, architecture's an act of art and it touches an emotion. Yeah. Actually, that's something else that came up too about you know our response to architecture. Um, I think everybody who looks at our buildings sees beyond the function of the building. And I think the emotive response to a building is a very powerful statement. And just as our emotive response to design is a very powerful statement as well. Yeah, uh, but I, I don't know. I mean, if you, you can't divorce function from architecture, right? I mean, uh, it, because the moment you really divorce function from architecture, then architecture has to compete with art. It becomes sculptural. And Pache Sean, architects just aren't sculptors. Uh, there was a great interview uh, uh, between Frank Gehry and Richard Serra, uh, the great American uh, sculptor on, on Charlie Rose, which is you know, our great talk show host, very uh, thoughtful man. And Frank and uh, Richard were actually very good friends. They collaborated on a number of projects. And at one point, um, Charlie Rose said to Frank Gehry, so, you know, your work is really sculptural. Do you think of yourself as a sculptor? And he said, yes, I do. And Richard Serra stared at him and said, well, you're not. Uh, and I think we shouldn't forget that. that uh, and by the way, Richard Serra is not an architect. Uh, you know, one's not better than the other, but they're actually very different uh, enterprises. And I, I do think function is a vitally important dimension of architecture. Of course it is. And, and, absolutely. And you know, the great architecture that does survive, that has some claim to permanence, generally does so because its function, it serves its function exceptionally well. Yeah, I, I, well, of course, I think everybody would agree that you know, a building is there, uh, and uh, an architecture is there to fulfill a function. But it's, it's, it's the way that it you know, sort of defines that function and actually can evolve with the function as well. It seems to me that gives life to a building as well. Absolutely. And you know, who's going to take away from architecture's ability to create deeply felt emotive responses? And of course it does. And I think uh, that's one of the Sean, things... Sean, if you put in heating here, that wouldn't be a bad idea. <laughs> now we can just bring this down. It's just the wind coming up down back. Teasing. <laughs> no, I like so being cold. It, it's fresh air. <laughs> Keeps us alive. Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> yeah, no, 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 exactly. We can't have that. It's, I mean, let's get back to this business about the, 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 the evolving, the temporiness of, of architecture, which I think is, is, is I think it's a fairly new notion. I, I mean, the idea you've said that maybe we've always thought that architecture is, is not permanent. I must admit, I find that, to me, that's a bit of a challenge, I have to say, because I've always thought of architecture as, uh, if not permanent in fact, permanent in intent. I don't, I mean, that's a very Western idea, don't you think, Evan? I mean, yeah, think because, because coming from China, where all they do is put up buildings so that they fall down the next minute, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> but I think of all the great traditions in uh, Latin America and in uh, 
Africa, the, those buildings don't make, and in, 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 in India, I'm not talking about the moguls and the great yeah. monuments, I'm talking about vernacular buildings that were never intended to be, to be yeah. permanent. Yeah. Even mosques that are built uh, in Africa are constantly being reshaped, reformed, rebuilt. Um, so I, you know, permanence get, makes me twitchy. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think we're talking, we're talking about evolution of buildings yeah. and the way that they can adapt to change and, and to new uses and things like that. But even the claim, even the claim that the intent is to ha is to be there forever. I mean, adaptability. I you brought that up before. Adaptability, of course, is a different problem from the intent of permanence. And I, I mean, I, mean, I think some architecture makes that claim, and some architects want to. Uh, wanted, yeah. but I think it's, it's more subtle and more yeah. supple than that. Let's think. Let's talk about design too. Design. I, I'm, I've been beating on about design forever because I, I, I think in our on the pragmatic world we often overlook the power mm -hmm. of attraction and, and the kind of indelible quality of design. And when I think of a product, you know, whether it doesn't matter whether it's a toaster or a car or whatever, it's <coughs> often struck me that the first thing one sees is design. It's the first thing you see. Then you go into the mechanics of it, and whether it works, and whether it does it, whether it burns the toast, or makes the toast, or throws it out, and, and then how much it costs. Then you come back, and I think the final decision is probably always a fairly subjective one, on the, the, the design and the appeal of the design. It seems to me that design is one of those things that, I don't know, it seems to me that it's very prevalent, but at the same time, and we're very receptive to it, but I think it's a kind of undervalued aspect of things. Um, and, and I'm not saying it about, uh, necessarily about architecture, because right now, I've just driven here, you know, from, from, from Naomi's place, past that wonderful football stadium. You know, one that looks like a lot of soccer balls? It's fantastic. Uh, I, I know I shouldn't say this here, but there's uh, I'm talking about proper football. <laughs> Played with a round ball. But that's a fantastic movie. And it, uh, to me, it, you know, we talked about, you know, there's got to be an emotional response to the, even the most functional buildings. But here's a building in which they play football. And the whole thing looks like a football. I mean, I think that's, I think that's a, a, you know, extraordinary thing. But, uh, and it's a wonderful piece of architecture. I hope it works as well. I've not been in it, but I, I'm sure it does. This notion of, of this emotive response to architecture uh, and, and how we actually read the, the, the emotive response to architecture. No, I, th I think if it doesn't move you, right? If it doesn't get you excited or make you think or put you in a different frame of mind, then it hasn't achieved one of its goals. One, of, you know, it's not. You know, I, I was harping about function, but architecture's role isn't simply to be utilitarian. Yeah. It's to, to change the way you might understand something. And, you know, great buildings, even not so great buildings, have the capacity to make you feel differently. You know, you were you were talking about the, the football stadium here. You know, the Allianz football stadium outside of Munich that Herzog de Moron designed. Out yeah. of it's about 10 years ago. I mean, you just can't. If that doesn't make you excited, yeah. if you don't feel like, I want to see what's going on yeah. on the pitch, yeah. then you, you, you're brain dead, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And, that, and that applies. But it's also the relationship between function and, uh, and form as well, about buildings, that can they sort of echo and reflect somehow their function? Well, the old modernist uh, trope was that form and function followed each other, right? That they had to be glued to each other. I don't think they have to be glued to each other, but they have to have some kind of dialogue with each other, right? And otherwise, things go pretty askew quickly. Well, well let's talk about the, 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 the art museum then as well, because you've oh, been talking thing. about that thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I better well, interview you now. You yeah, know a lot more no, about no, it than I one, do. There's one right behind us. <laughs> Uh, we won't go into that. <laughs> it's a beautiful building. It is. It's a beautiful building. It's just been ruined, that's all. <laughs> you can say that. I'm not sure I can, actually. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's a fantastic building, you know? Those great courtyards that delivered light and air. 
so the building could breathe. Now the poor thing's strangled. And it's got all that cutlery inside it. It looks like a bloody kitchen with all that stuff going all over the place. Dreadful. Anyway. Um, but the art museum, I mean, here's a classic example. I remember, you know, when we, when I first started the business, really the buildings weren't that important. They were all sort of neoclassical somehow. And it's interesting here, apart from here, but if you look at you know, in the Sydney Gallery, you look at Adelaide, they're sort of neoclassical buildings. They were, they were, they were erected in, in, you know, in aspiration at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century to what we aspired to be, presumably. Um, but they've, they've now, you know, moved on. And uh, you know, to, I found that architects maybe loved the idea of the challenge of an art museum. When you were, you know, developing the building, is that what you found? Yes, but I also think that the, you know, it's a lot less expensive to build a fancy building uh, that might attract people than it is to build a great collection. So I think there's a tendency to say, you know, deliver me a fabulous building that's going to be incredibly attractive and here's a sum of money, when in fact it would take 10 times or 100 times that sum of money to actually build a great collection. But at the end of the day, we should never forget that an art museum is about the art, right? That's, that's why you ultimately go to art museums. You might go to look at a great building once, but you're not going to return You'll go to a great museum over and over again because you see art that moves you, uh, that's interesting, that's constantly changing. So I'm a huge advocate of the importance of architecture and how it can enhance that experience of going to a museum. But I think the priorities have to really be properly aligned. And there's a huge tendency when you, you get especially aspirational cities and aspirational patrons to say, okay, I'll build a beautiful building because that will symbolize what I want. But it's a very transitory uh, endeavor. What he's saying is that his job, of course, is much more difficult than the architect's job. <laughs> we, we'll bat that one. You can, at, you can look at the scores on no, my no, back. I have proof of that. But it's absolutely correct. Of course it is. It's absolutely correct. But somehow, you know, it, it, I mean, we talk about buildings reflecting and echoing their role and their purpose and their values. I mean, if the art's inspiration of, you know, the idea that you want a building that, uh, in which the, the artist's house is, is equally stimulating, I think it's a perfectly valid thing to, to, to see. But uh, I'm just going back to some of the, some of the, uh, the buildings. I remember having a conversation with, um, Somebody called Ernst Baylor, who you might know, and uh, Renzo Piano. And I don't know whether any of you have been to the Baylor Museum in Basel. I'm sure you have. Yes. Um, and it was designed by Renzo Piano. And Ernst was you know, the great collector. He was a wonderful collector. Uh, and um, he was somebody I've known for, forever. And um, he's a very quiet, but determined, and a rather reserved individual. Uh, he was Swiss, and Renzo was not Swiss. <laughs> it was very ebullient kind of individual. And we had a talk, with the three of us, a public talk. And it was very interesting because the building is absolutely Ernst Baylor's building. It's, it's totally, it was to house his collection, you know yes. the building, and it, it absolutely echoes his sense of perfection and restraint. But, uh, but he, he, he actually guided Renzo Piano in the most perfect way. And when we did the talk, Renzo Piano probably, uh, let's say we talked for an hour, probably um, Ernst had 10 minutes and, and Renzo had 50 minutes. But ultimately, Ernst made the decisions. You could feel this wonderful sort of rapport going on, whereby you know he, he, he called the shots, and Renzo went through the whole rigmarole about his school. Well, that reminds me of another great anecdote. So, uh, 
in the 1960s, late 1960s, there was an interview between Walter Cronkite, who was a major American broadcaster, and Philip Johnson, a uh, very important architect. He was a trustee of the Museum of Modern Art. He was the founding director of our Department of Architecture and Design. And Louis Kahn, who I would argue is perhaps the greatest architect of the 20th century. And if he isn't, he's certainly one of the two or three. And Walter would ask a question of Louis, and Louis would kind of mumble, and he couldn't speak, and Philip would answer it. And then he'd ask a question of Philip, and Philip would talk for about five or six minutes. Then he'd turn to Louis Kahn and ask him a question, and he'd kind of uh, mumble a few words. And of course, what was clear was that Philip Johnson had a great facility to talk, but he wasn't a very good architect. Uh, and Louis Kahn couldn't talk, but he was a brilliant talk, architect. Yeah, yeah. You know, we all communicate differently. <laughs> Louis Kahn's building is the, the Kimball one, in, which you've probably seen. In, which is, it's, it's as close to God as you'll ever get. Yes. But again, but it, it begs a question, you know, you've got a building which is perfect, and it's perfectly formed. How does that building continue to evolve? Because it's an institution that's got a, that in itself has to evolve. Can that building evolve? Yeah, you know, it's a great question and produced an enormous controversy because the Kimball started out as a small museum, really a pavilion, yeah. not unlike this, chock full of extraordinary art. And uh, decades after it had opened, it needed to expand because the collection had grown and its audience had grown. And it could, it, there was an architectural proposal to do an addition to it that was based actually on drawings that. Uh, Khan had done. Yeah. This was sort of simply uh, realizing Khan's uh, design, and the architectural community went absolutely nuts yeah, yeah, over yeah. it. Pacha again, Sean, you guys are really rough <laughs> on your peers. Uh, the community went absolutely crazy, and the project died, and you know, decades after that, an addition was done, and the, dis the decision was to kind of hide it in the background, to make it disappear so it wouldn't ultimately engage Khan's perfect pavilion. Well, I actually think Khan would have had a heart attack with the idea that his building had become frozen in aspect, had become such a gem that it couldn't ever have a, 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 a larger couldn't life. Uh, especially when he himself had imagined how it could evolve and had created actually a, a, a structure that had replicability built into it. So I, I, I'm very wary when things become so precious that we, and that's works of art as much as it is, as it is architecture, that we can't imagine them in any other context. Well, that's just this, that the building is not finite, but you know, the work of art probably is finite, isn't it? But, I mean, you know, artists do go back and retouch their paintings or enlarge their projects, but even more importantly, they move them, right? You know, there's this, there's this thing that we get used to a work of art in a certain position and we think that's the only place it can ever be and then you try and move it somewhere else and people go, how could you do that? You've ruined my experience. Well, so as soon as you move it, they think they're looking at a new picture, which is, I think, is terrific. It happens, it happens all the time. It's, I think it's absolutely fascinating the way that happens. It's a little trick we play. It makes people think we're growing the collection. Exactly. You don't have to buy any more pictures, just shovel them around the wall. Works, it works a treat. Um, but the, the uh, but this this thing about the, the Khan thing. I, I, do you know the Kimball? You probably many of you have seen it. It is. It is if you haven't, you have to go there. Yeah. Fort Worth, you know, it's kind it's of a host lovely sort it. of barrel of things yeah. like this. It, it, it is. It is beautiful. It is. It is a perfectly formed building. But it's interesting that um, you know he that, that Khan's view was that this could evolve. This could. This could change because uh, there's been some issues with buildings in this country where um, the architects have not been uh, too welcoming of that attitude towards their building. I've met one or two not here back in the United States. I've <laughs> run into them, actually. Uh, but, yes, architects, no, we won't go there. Anyway, get, let's get back to this, this lovely thing about what, what can we do with, with buildings that, uh, you know, that, that, that give us an architectural experience like this. And yet, you know, there's there's no intention for them to be permanent there. We can we can have this experience. We can, you know, sense new ideas, sense new ways of looking at a building, sense new ways of using a building, and then just ship it off and do something else. It moves on. Maybe it moves to another location. Maybe it 
gets dismantled and reconfigured in a different way, and another pavilion replaces it. And the very fact that it's shaped differently creates a, a completely different set of opportunities for those of us who get to use it. So, I, I mean, I think it's an interesting challenge for an architect to be told, by the way, your building has a shelf life of three months or six months or whatever it is. I, I worked for a while, Edmund knows this, at the Freer and Sackler Galleries, which are in, in Washington, D.C. And the Freer Galleries is beautiful neoclassical pavilion that sits on the mall. And the Sackler, which was a later addition, is actually underground. And I remember having a conversation with the architect, Jean-Paul Carillon. And of course, he was so twitchy about the fact that his building was going to be invisible, yeah. right? Yeah. That we're getting, yeah. you're very lucky you got the commission. Unfortunately, nobody will actually see your architecture. You know, it, but you know, you learn to deal. Well, it's, it's, yeah, a lot of the art didn't like going underground either, though. Neither did people, but that's no. another problem. <laughs> no. well, I think that's quite understandable. There's a certain connotation about going underground. No, but it does deal with permanence. <laughs> it's certainly well. <laughs> yeah, your immortality is enshrined. Don't worry about it. It's under. It's underground. It's a done deal. It's a done. Yeah. But I love the. I mean, I must say, I love the idea of this of coming here because this is a. This is a kind of. It's a kind of experiment. It's a physical experiment. It's also an emotional experiment, and it's an experiment with our imaginations about how we can how we can do it and how we can do different things with it and how we can use it. I, I think it's a great idea. I mean, you know, there's this issue of temporariness. Uh, we have a project that we do uh, at PS1, our contemporary yeah. place. And every summer we commission young architects at the beginning of their career to build a pavilion that has a, a given life of three months. A Serpentine has their project yeah. that looks at more senior architects, again, uh, with a very short life. And I would think if I was an architect that it'd be kind of interesting to say, okay, how do I build in a temporary way? What, a, what does that liberate me from having to deal with? You don't have to put a lot of plumbing in. You don't have to do a lot of electricity. There are all sorts of things that let you be uh, perhaps creative in a, in a different way. And maybe you learn something from it that you can then apply to other buildings. What about Sean? We, uh, can, we, can we ask you some questions now, Sean? Yeah. I, I, by the way, I was told earlier on by Robert, I've got to tell you something which I didn't, that we'd love for you to ask questions, and there's a microphone apparently. Oh, right there, yes. And there's another one here. And I just think it's time now that we would like to invite you all to, to say a few words. And, and let's begin with Sean and ask him how he went about how he went about creating this. Everyone here? Is that working? Yes. Yeah. No, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to answer your question. I'm going to go back to your comments on permanence. Yeah. So, architecture is definitely not permanent. It's not a permanent thing. Nothing that human beings make remains permanent. Ultimately, nature wins. And there's most of the Staffy's book on weathering. There's Rossi's um, notion of the collective memory. So, uh, if there's Let's not forget Ozymandias. Yeah, OK. There's the football stadium over there. If the football stadium got knocked out tomorrow and was no longer there, would it cease to exist in our collective memories? The answer is no, it wouldn't cease to exist. So architecture exists in the realm of the human spirit, and um, good architects let the spirit run free. But building is a physical act, and architecture, by definition, therefore, is a temporary thing. And the ultimate example of that in architecture in the world is the Ise Shrine in Japan, which this year is being rebuilt for every 20 years since 900 AD. Uh, it's, it's rebuilt. It's a timber building that's built over and over and over again because timber buildings don't last. So that, that, I just needed to make that comment. The barrel things at the Kimball are actually cycloid arches. Just to get that on the record, right out. beautiful, beautiful <laughs> things. So you make a cycloid arch by rotating a circle with a point on it across a line, and that makes the curve, which Louis Kahn used so beautifully. So, what was the question? <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> you're doing really well. Thanks. Uh, this di these We're are, having these a are on, the, on, on the lack of immortality. It's okay. It's oh. okay. No, it's, uh, it was about the approach to this. Uh, 
doing a temporary thing, or in this case, a building that's to be moved somewhere it's else, it's very temporary. hard. Yeah. It's very it's hard thing to do. Temporary. You can do a lot of stuff that stays unseen and covered up permanently when you're doing a building that's, in theory, going to be there forever. So making a building that moves is much, much harder because you've got to be able to put it back together again and, and ship it. And we did a we did a building called Future Shack that we shipped from Melbourne to the Cooper Hewitt in New York and exhibited in the garden there. Yeah. We packed it up here, put it on a boat, the boat went to Oakland in, in Los Angeles, it got on a train, went over to New York, we unpacked it, we assembled it, um, we packed it up again and we put it on the ship, the train and ship and brought it back. That wasn't easy, that was hard to do. It's much easier to, to just build something and leave it. Yeah. But, but doing something like this is, is an invitation to experiment, isn't it? Yeah, I think what Glenn said before is right. The, the, the notion of a project like this is that next year there'll be another piece of architecture yeah. here and a different architect explaining a completely different proposition for architecture. And all of that is healthy because there's no right, right way to um, produce a building. There, there are good ways and bad ways, but there's no right way. And the, one of the problems with architecture is that we get hooked on style all the time. Mm. And I noticed um, Frank Geary's been in the news recently, and I, and I started writing a letter to him today to, 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 to lend him my complete support and the insolence of the question that he was asked in Spain recently was just, just disgracefully disrespectful to a great what architect. What was the question? Uh, the implication in the question that his his effort um, in producing sketches had become perfunctory. And the problem... Now, now look at this building and look at Geary's work. They're, they're at opposite poles in terms of architectural propositions. But you can't underestimate the genius of someone like Frank Geary. And the weight of knowledge and talent and skill in a, in a sketch by Geary could never be underestimated. And the, the lack of respect by that reporter to that architect was profoundly disturbing, I thought. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but, you right. talked about the proposition just now, and the, and the next year there'll be somebody else be invited. Um, and the proposition about the opportunity that this presents. And you use that word proposition, which I thought was an interesting word to use because it puts the onus upon you to think about, you know, way, different ways of doing things. So when you approached this, what was the proposition that you had in your mind? Uh, well, it was a, a, a really interesting dynamic between Naomi and I because she's an experienced client I'm a reasonably experienced architect. And my misinterpretation of the brief originally was that we were going to do a folly, and a folly in the, in the 18th century landscape idea of a folly. So I, I did a, a, play, a, 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 a joke, really, about William Chambers' pagoda in the Kew Gardens. Oh, yeah. So I had a, 50, a 60 metre, his is 50 metres, I did a 60 metre structure here, and it was in, circular in plan, yeah. and a truncated... Um, <laughs> truncated cone with an oculus at the top. <laughs> with an oculus at the top, because I'd just been back to see the Pantheon after a, a long time, and so I thought that would be beautiful. And it was, it was never going to see the light of day, because it couldn't handle a, a, an event like this one. So ultimately, the, the project became pro the production of a building like all the buildings that I do, where there's scheme after scheme after scheme after scheme, and then there's the right scheme. And that um, misconception that architects sort of breeze in and a geniuses and breeze back out again is just not, it's not the fact of the matter. The fact, the fact of producing any building, regardless of size, is that you go through a reasonably rigorous process um, and out the other end there's a result. And the, the brutality of architecture is that the results there, good, bad or indifferent, for everyone to assess and um, judge. And that's, that's what makes architects so precious about their buildings being tinkered with. <laughs> there's no hiding. <laughs> there's no, there's no, no hiding. And let's talk about, a bit about, um, about uh, ornamentation on buildings as well. Um, you know, there's a classic example over here in Federation Square. Uh, and, you know, the idea of, of decor and form as well. Yeah. Is, is that is that something that's ever played into your mind? Ah, uh, yeah. I have a, a quote 
above my drawing board, I still use a drawing board, um, by Louis Sullivan, the, the great American architect. Um, and uh, he, the ornamentation on his building in Buffalo and his building in St. Louis is spectacular. And you know, you're talking about form and function before, he's the granddaddy of it. So yeah, ornamentation is a really important part of, of any building, but it's how, how the individual architect chooses to decorate. For my work, I choose to, to try and reduce things. In Don's building, there's there's an overt um, intent. It, the, the decoration is represented in, in geometry that, that manifests itself on the facade. In, in Frank Gehry's work, it's form, but it's form that's founded in, in the function of the building. And I couldn't agree more with, with uh, Glenn's comments before about architects are not sculptors. The worst architecture in the world is done by architects who make a form and then shove a program into the form. Yeah. And that never works. Architecture doesn't work that way. It come, comes from a completely different point. Do you mind if you comment on that? No, I agree. I think it was beautifully said. And you know, decoration or ornament can be thought of, it's much more elastic than something that's simply applied. I mean, I think these beautiful screens that uh, can move up and down here, create a kind of visual engagement for this pavilion that you could say was ornamental. I don't think that's their intent because they're serving a function, but you clearly thought about them in a way to animate what is otherwise a very orthogonal uh, building. It's, uh, it's, that's, that's architecture on a knife edge where you you go on the knife edge and say, well, if I don't pull that off, this will just be a dumb box and it will be a failure. But if you pull it off, then it's it's delightful. And what you were saying before about, I, I use this example a lot, that I can't, when I'm doing a working drawing, I can't, I can't write on the working drawing, make the users of this building feel great when they walk in. <laughs> you can't do that. So the, the reality of architecture is it's the manipulation of, of architectonics and building construction that hopefully liberates the architecture. And, and in my office, I say the architecture actually exists in the, in the person. And the, and the architect brings that out of the person by the way they or, organise space and um, materials and so on. I would like now to ask um, people to uh, throw a question at, at, at Glenn or, 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 or Edmund. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> thank you very much for coming and enriching us with your different perspectives. And thank you, Naomi Milgram, for building this wonderful experience for for us to partake in. Um, what, has, uh, what is striking sitting here in your pavilion, um, Sean, is that uh, the openness to the outside and the openness to the city and to the landscape as well, which becomes framed and almost, almost like a pictorial experience as well. Um, so I guess I was interested in your reflections on, um, it seems to me that in contemporary architecture, there has been a turn to opening the museum and recent architectures to the city. Certainly, if we look at, for example, the radical gesture of the Saint Pompidou opening in France in 77 was the first building really open to the city, which has then had to go through uh, different uh, architectural transformations to adapt to its function, of course. Uh, but in your, um, at MoMA and in your different experiences, it feels like we're still talking about inviting the city um, to look in, which is a big transition from the security mechanisms that were around museums uh, in neoclassical conceptions. So I think I was interested to hear, we were talking about Frank Gehry and, and your space today. Frank's recent uh, project in France is also open like a, like a cocoon as well. So that porosity between the city and the museum and, and the openness to the city in, in architecture is what I was interested to have your thoughts on. I'll, you, you, you speak right. By the way, I just had to, this is, you know, two minutes of advertising here. He did such an incredible job at the Art Gallery of New South Wales, having just spent a couple of days wandering around those galleries and looking at what a spectacular museum put together. Right? So, we <laughs> like to think it's supposed to be image. <laughs> well, it's all, it's all, it's all of the above. Uh, but you can never take away the personality of the director. Uh, no, I actually think a very interesting thing has happened over the last 
let's call it 50 years, and the Centre Pompidou probably was the catalyst for this. The, that neoclassical museum that Edmund was talking about was generally set in a park, uh, like the uh, yeah, Museum. Often you had to rise up a couple of steps, so not only were Slight you... Slight elevation. Right? You were, you were ascending to culture, and you were being removed from the fabric of the city. Uh, in order to enter this temple of the muses, right? And the Centre Pompidou was a fundamentally urban institution that said, actually, the experience of the museum should engage the city, and that actually built on really uh, what happened at the Museum of Modern Art in 1929 when the founder of the museum, Alfred Barr, in his first purpose-built building that uh, was realized in 1936, took the museum down to the street, got rid of those steps, had nothing but windows so you could look in, uh, and it invited the city into the museum, but it invited the museum out into the city. And that was a very different kind of model. It was a model that didn't see the museum as a treasure chest. It saw the museum as a laboratory, a place of experimentation and engagement. And I think over the years, as curators sought to create the perfect environmental conditions in which to look at art, in which we moved away from natural lighting and thought that only incandescent lighting could uh, allow us to see works of art well. We kind of closed the museum back into its little nest. The Centre Pompidou blew that open, uh, and what we've certainly tried to do at the Museum of Modern Art is to continue to open up the box to make the museum as transparent as possible, not just as a symbol of openness, but as a recognition that art, as we understand it, we deal only with modern and especially contemporary art, art is not disassociated from everyday life. It is an intrinsic part of everyday life. So you need an architecture that engages you with everyday life in order to understand those objects better. So, you know, to me, this sense of transparency is also tied in entirely with this notion you were talking about earlier. Sorry, I can go on forever about this, so just shut me up. You were talking about the sense of passive versus active. I, I'd actually use the word participatory, that that transparency invites participation. And what we want out of museums, or what many people want out of museums today, is a participatory experience, not only with the art they're looking at, but with the ability to engage in the creation of art. That's why performance artists like Marina Abramovich or Roman Andak or Tino Segal have become so successful because they've invited us to work with them in making art. And that sense of participation liberates our own sense of creativity. So they want a participatory experience, not only with each other as they're looking around, but with the artists themselves. And so creating a sense of openness becomes an invitation for engagement. And that doesn't take away from those who want a more contemplative, maybe even solitary experience. But I think there's a huge pull today towards that sense of engagement, of wanting to be part of a conversation. Well, I don't I mean, know where that goes. No, no, but I was brought up in the, in the hermetically sealed museum environment, as we all probably were. And I, I must admit, it was something that it really grated against me. And when I came to the Art Gap of New South Wales and found a, an extension that had windows, I thought, this is bliss. And it's a little bit like here, as you were saying, with, with Sean's thing. The fact that these, the, the, the light, the cloud, you know, everything varies. So what we see in here is a variable quality. And, so, and that, again, is an, is an evolving experience for us sitting in here. And the things that I loved about the fact that with, with the, the extensions, everything that we uh, put on at the Art Gallery of South Wales, they absolutely insisted on having those views. That not only that for that connection with the outside world, so that you were not, you know, you're not disassociated from it, but above all for the variations from the outside life, outside everything varies. Inside, we're the same. And that's why I'm so, I'm so, you know, rude about what's happened over here. Because I feel the quality 
of the variance of light and experience and atmosphere has been absolutely throttled in that building. Uh, I take it you're not happy. I, I, <laughs> you, I haven't started yet. <laughs> Uh, but it's uh, uh, this question of, of, of you know, as you know, as Ben was saying about you know, feeling much more part of the experience and part of and part of the experience of the art and part of the practice of the art has got very much to do with actually being connected to the real world outside the institution. And you're absolutely right. This funny thing about, as I said, you know, when we these buildings were put up, there was a sense of sort of aspiration about you know, the, the classic world and what it represented about having to go up the steps and all that. It's, 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 it's all there, and it's quite extraordinary in a way that it still, it still happens. Sorry, okay, long, another question, sorry. Um, thank you very much for um, My question is in regards to education. If you don't mind, I just want to get your opinion about current education internationally. I mean, looking at the 20th century, the Bauhaus, everybody else, do you think that we're offering the same level of ethos to uh, people who are going through art and design and education. Do you think 100 years from now we'll be still studying 20th century design, or is this century going to contribute something to that capacity? John will hope so. I am very old fashioned about educating architects. I think um, a, there's a real problem in the profession generally at the moment. Mm -hmm. and, that is that we don't teach um, first principles anymore. There's a lot of seduction in the in the digital world that takes us away from fundamental technique. And you know, if if you're going to be a good architect, you've got to be technically very very good, and you need to um, be trained to, to to be very good. And there's a lot of steps that are being skipped now in our schools around the world. And the other component of architecture that I think is absolutely essential is, is a fundamentally good knowledge of the history of architecture from at least Egypt. And if you don't know that, you, 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 you really, you, you, you haven't got a hope. You, you can't, if I can't have a conversation with you about, you know, John Soane or Michelangelo or Borromini or Bernini or or whoever it is, then I can't really talk to you about architecture. So I can't be an architect. I hope so. I feel rather the same about the history of art too. Um, there's, there's, there's many a pundit of contemporary art who wouldn't know absolutely sod all about the art of the past, which I'm afraid I am deeply skeptical about. How do you feel about that, Gov? Don't, I don't disagree with you at all about that. <laughs> but I'm old fashioned too. I mean, you know, we're. You know, that's part of the way we were brought up, that you had to be, you had to know history before you could deal with the present. Yeah. Uh, and I was just, had this, when you were talking, Sean, I had this vision of, you know, my children, or maybe my children's children. You know, you don't need to learn how to do addition. You go to Wikipedia on your phone and you just say how to add, right? <laughs> it's like, you know, you do need the fundamentals. Yeah. You can't, you know, somebody like Frank Gehry, who's a brilliant architect, can't explode architecture without actually understanding what he's exploded, right? You have to have this fundamental grasp of the principles in order to then know how to break them apart and remake them. And so, you know, knowledge is learning. It just, it's not easy. It takes time and energy. G Gary's little Venice Beach projects in the late 70s, early 80s, he was just using drywall and plywood yeah. and corrugated iron and making really important little pieces of architecture that um, underpinned his later work. And that was the, that was in the midpoint of his career. So um, those, those exercises, those exercises that probably will never make the cover of a magazine are really important for architects and you can't skip those steps. If you think you can, you're making a fundamental um, career error. It's, it's as simple as that. And in my enormous office of, of a couple of people, we still do the tiny projects um, and we're doing a 70 square metre project at the moment. That's one of the most exciting things I've worked on in years and years and years. So you can't not do that and think that you can get through. It doesn't work. Sorry. I'm just going back to the discussion of opening up museums such as the um, the uh, 
hope you do. Let's hope you do, yeah. Um, I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on Mona in Hobart, which is it's all underground, subterranean, and yet is very much an experience of interaction between the artists yes. and the public. It's a very good point. It's a very good point because it completely demolished. It's all our arguments. <laughs> um, but yeah. that's David Walsh for you. Actually, he demolishes all our preconceptions totally because it's the most brilliant place. Let's face it; it's absolutely brilliant. And, and it completely denies the existence of the rest of the world. Uh, so all, all, all our, all our, all our sort of pre preconceptions are completely dismissed by that. But I think that's probably his intention. There is it, no, there is no the, typology, no, right? No. That's, in, that's the really important takeaway. Yeah, it, it is. It is. A, you, you, have you been there? You no, but I have I know, been reading about it extensively. It is, well, I think many, most. I think everybody here has probably been to Mona, haven't you? Because yeah. it, it's one of the most extraordinary things, and you know, I, I, you've got to applaud what he's done down there. Uh, but you say, okay, there's no natural light. It's all underground. But it's not disconnected from the world. Because when you go down there, one of the things that you're, you're positively aware of all the time is the sandstone walls that speak to you when you're down there. It's a very emotive experience, in fact, even if it is subterranean. So I don't think you're quite, uh, you're quite sort of disassociated. Instead of seeing the sky, you're seeing the rock. You know, you, the, the natural world is still there. It's not, it's not gleaming with light but it's certainly gleaming with experience. Does contemporary art need natural light to be exhibited? No, no I mean, it's not, it's not so much about needing light, whether it's well, artificial or, or, or natural. It's actually about being attached to a, a natural source and to, to the world outside the museum world. I'm just asking for my art gallery in New South Wales scheme that I'm working on. <laughs> Pointers, he wants pointers. <laughs> oh, no, nothing, girl. Oh, no, nothing. <laughs> Just let me write this down. I'll tell you what, yeah. So, uh, but does, don't, don't does forget the light. Don't forget work. the light. Yeah. Doesn't I mean, natural light fade artwork? Yeah, of course it does. Yeah. Oh, we don't put those photographs in no, the light. No, 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 absolutely not. All, all the ways is painting. No, no. However, however, um, if after looking at them you have the experience of life, it's sort of, you know, it's important. Help. Another, another question. Uh, hi, Glenn. I had a question about the project that Interborough did for PlayStation. Yes. Uh, I'm trying to remember it. It's like, okay, come on. I'm get... yeah. just wondering whether that was perhaps a different kind of impermanence, given that at the end of it, it was neither disassembled or relocated but the parts were distributed out into yeah. the local community? Yeah, it was, you know, what they were doing, this was a project that was one of the um, uh, summer projects we did at PS1, and the, the question that they were grappling with was uh, the problem of sustainability uh, and, and adaptive reuse. Uh, and they came up with this notion that they would work with the community about think the, the local community about things they might need, park benches, uh, trash barrels, seats, uh, and they, they would essentially design a project around um, materials that could go back into the community so that they would be recycled and therefore they were being sustainable. Hey, you know, it was a more interesting idea than it was a satisfying architectural experience, honestly. Um, but that's what these projects are about. They're about these propositions. Can you build a truly sustainable building that can be dismantled, uh, dispersed, and then reused without wasting uh, resources? And from that point of view, I think it was very successful. Uh, but. And, it, and one of the fascinating things is over the course of the 14 years we've been doing these summer pavilions, the question of sustainability has emerged as a principal preoccupation of most of the architects. So they're building uh, intentionally temporary buildings, but they're also thinking about uh, sustainability. How do they recycle the materials they're using? Uh, this summer's pavilion was the ultimate in that. Uh, 
there was a mad inventor at a university in upstate New York that had come up with a new compound, which is essentially ground up mushrooms that have been metabolized so that they uh, create a, um, a material that can be formed like a brick. Uh, and it's 100% carbon neutral. Very light, structurally very strong. So the, the architect that uh, won the competition this year proposed essentially building a pavilion out of this new material that would be uh, absolutely carbon neutral. And, and basically mushrooms. Basically mushrooms that are forced to grow in a mold with some other yeah. chemicals. Um, and it was a fascinating idea and it, it produced these bricks. Uh, and then he built a very simple brick structure, corbelling it up into a spiral. And it was 100% biodegradable because as soon as it rained, guess what happened? <laughs> so over the course of the three months, this building kind of turned into a gelatinous soup. Uh, but it was a really interesting idea. So my, my, my point here is not to make fun of the building because it's a very serious architect and a very serious idea, is that the nature of these temporary projects is that they allow architects to be experimental to push the envelope in terms of ideas, materials, design, that you wouldn't necessarily be able to do in something that you demand, that, that demands a more durable uh, aspect. Is this not a problem with some contemporary buildings? And I'm thinking of one or two that I've seen, which are made of materials that actually need to be pristine all the time. And I don't know whether you've seen the the Jewish Museum in Berlin, the Lipskin building. Have you seen it? Well, you know, it's a sort of shiny building. It's got to be shiny. And I went to see it one day, and you know, it's got all these odd-shaped windows and things, sort of like scars. And firstly, the, this shiny exterior was looking a little soiled, and it just didn't sort of work. And then there was this sort of odd-shaped window, this sort of you know, angular window with a neck curtain and you could look up there the neck curtain was a sort of washing up liquid sitting in the window and you thought this just doesn't work this is about this is about a different kind of a, a, a sort of sustainability of, 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 of a very practical nature uh, you know using the building but also keeping the building in the in the in the state that it works because sometimes if, it, if it's not kept in that state you know, it's simply not fulfilling its role of building and, and, and engaging you on the same emotive level that you need to. I think it's a bit of a disaster, that building. I can say that probably, but still, anyway. Hello, Naomi. <laughs> there any more questions? What's the time? Okay. Okay. I have a question. Oh, you have a question. Um, Are you going to shout it? I will no, shout it. No, use this. It's, to, it's actually to Glenn. That's all right. Use um, this. I really want to get up in front of you. Now you see what Glenn. it feels like. <laughs> no, I'm very nervous. But so am I. I. I'm wondering if you could um, speak to the process of choosing the architects for the current expansion to MoMA and how any consensus was arrived at, actually, in that decision. That's what he wants to know, too. <laughs> it's windows. It's all yeah. about windows. <laughs> no, uh, we invited five architectural firms to come in and talk to us, uh, mostly uh, New York-based, but not, not all New York-based. Uh, we, uh, we decided that this was going to be more of a surgical series of moves rather than uh, a rebuilding. Effectively, what we're doing is we're, we acquired a small parcel of land immediately to our west. It used to be the home of the American Folk Art Museum. If you read the American press, people were really happy when we decided to tear it down. Um, and uh, it came a bit of fleck on that one. <laughs> Sick transit, Gloria Mundi. Yes. I'll actually come back to why that, what, what was interesting about that experience. Um, and then adjacent to that building is a tower that is being built. 
uh, residential tower in which we get six floors for galleries. So this project is really about some minor renovations in our existing building in order to lock in to the little sliver space that will be the transition space into uh, these new galleries we have. So that's how it started. Of course, leave an architect with a simple problem, and before you know it, it grows into a larger project, uh, which is good because it, it And we decided on Diller, Scafidio, and Renfro because we felt they understood our problem the best. They had the, the most interesting set of ideas about how we could make these three different aspects work modifying the existing building, adding a new space, connecting into um, the galleries that are in the tower. And, you know, it's been a fascinating journey. They're really smart, very uh, methodical, uh, fearless in terms of what they're doing. Uh, the, you know, but architecture uh, engenders passion. And so when we uh, announced that we were demolishing the Folk Art Building because it didn't work for us, uh, we were, you know, it was like stepping on a hornet's nest in part, we knew that was going to happen, in part because the building's only 11 years old, so how could you tear down a building that's only 11 years old? In part because the architects are still alive and obviously they care passionately and they have friends who care passionately and uh, ultimately it led to a very uh, interesting debate that Liz and I participated in. Um, with a group of uh, architects and architectural critics, and the bo and which was fine by me because this has got to be you have to be willing to talk about what you're doing, uh, in, in, you know, in the mess of or the heat of the moment, um, you know, what was forgotten was that that the architects built this um, building for the Folk Art Museum uh, that ultimately. Uh, contributed, wasn't the only reason, but contributed to the fact that the Folk Art Museum went bankrupt. Uh, they turned to us uh, and asked us if we would uh, help save them by buying their debt. Not by buying the building, but by buying the debt that they had to take out on that building, which we agreed to do. Uh, it was adjacent to us, so obviously we had self-interest. Uh, and we spent you know, quite a lot of time trying to look at how we could adapt and use the building. Uh, and couldn't figure out how to do it. We announced that we were going to demolish it, created a storm. We hired Dillers, Scafidi, and Renfro. They said that they would only take the job on the condition that they had the opportunity to reconsider that decision. Uh, and if they could come up with a solution uh, that we would be willing to accept it, we said, done deal. <laughs> Who wouldn't want to come up with a solution that, that saved us and them and everyone else from the agony of doing this? They spent six months looking at it, and turned to us and said, there's no way to make this work. Uh, that was just a reality. Uh, part of the problem was that the site's only 40 feet wide, so by the time you put in all of the services that are actually required by code, elevators, bathrooms, fire stairs, etc., there's nothing left. Uh, there's literally nothing left. And I remember one of the more prominent architects in New York coming through the building after we made this announcement, got all the way up to the top of the building and said, there's nothing but an, use the vulgar word, stare here. Uh, so we were, f we, we made a tough decision. So uh, it's, I, I believe it was the right decision. Uh, uh, we'll see, the proof now, or the, the challenge now is that we need to replace that with something that is even better than what was there before, so that the onus is on us. We take that responsibility very seriously. I can assure you the architects do as well. Uh, but that's what's exciting about the world we live in, is that, I, honestly, I wish they, that the debate had been less rancorous and more thoughtful, because the issues were important. But the reality is, I was, you know, I felt invigorated by the fact that people cared so much that they were willing to really get into a, a, a heated discussion. And I have an enormous admiration for Liz Diller, principal in the firm, because when we did this debate uh, with the architectural community, she stood up there and she walked everybody through it. And she did it with such conviction and passion and earnestness, it was pretty hard not to sort of go, they didn't make this decision lightly. Right? This is not, it was not capricious. It was the result of an enormous amount of thinking. 
And great architecture can only come from a lot of thinking, right? It, 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 you don't just do that and get something terrific. Does that but, get to the answer? But this begs the question, another question, which is very pertinent for you, running a museum that deals with the art of our time, and with Sean, who's thinking about the future, um, about this, you know, what's next for, for MoMA? You know, you're doing this bit. What happens next? What happens in another two or three decades' time? Because this is something which has been playing on my mind, and I started this, my, my thinking on this about six or seven years ago, thinking about the next 30 or 40 years of the place <coughs> that I was in, and you know what would happen in the next three or four decades, and then the, de the decades after that. Uh, and it's about this perpetual growth of the of the museum material culture, which is a, a sort of a philosophical question as to how you deal with it. You mean what happens when the museums in New York occupy all of Manhattan? Basically, <laughs> yes. This is exactly, this is what I, you know. We are we are on a pattern of, of perpetual growth, and it's actually something that uh, you cannot you cannot uh, continue to acquire without editing. And I think to me it's a fundamental <laughs> issue facing the you know the, the institutions that care, collect, and maintain material culture. I think that's not right. I mean, but I also think every institution both has its mission and mandate and has its limitations. So at some point, you exceed your resources. Uh, and, and when that happens, you stop growing. You become something else. Uh, it hasn't happened yet, though. Oh, it's happened with lots of places. Well, I know, but they yeah, they put a sort of, you know, a 1900 or, or a 2000 end yeah. to, to things and it's moved on elsewhere. But yeah, it, to me, it's one of the things that, um, I mean, an institution like, like, like MoMA uh, has its life, has its life has been, been part of the art and the creativity now. Just as, you know, here, just as the Art Gallery of South Wales has. And it's been part of their, their vital life, has been involved with the art of its time. Once you delete that or move on from that, it becomes a very different institution. I agree. I mean, I think the fundamental Museum of Modern Art was founded by Alfred Barr and a group of extraordinary trustees with a proposition that it would be the place you could go to to discover the art of the present. Yeah. And it built a collection only to explain the present. So you needed the antecedents only to the degree that they were required so to really enable you to understand, understand now. Yeah. So, and, and the, the metaphor that Barr developed for the museum was a torpedo moving through time with the nose, the ever advancing present, mm. right, sorry, the ever advancing future, and the tail, the ever receding past. And he imagined that that torpedo would be about two generations long, a 50-year oh, nice. window, okay. and that you would shed the past, yes. okay. you would literally sell the past, mm. in order to provide the funds to acquire yeah. well, the, 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 the future. Yeah. And what happened over time, as we developed an ever more significant collection, is our trustees put a bungee cord exactly. on the tail. Exactly. So we get crazy. So, so, the, the past so you couldn't, you couldn't, you couldn't, do, you couldn't start, you know, hiving off the tail. But That's we, the problem. But we actually, unlike problem. most museums, and certainly probably unlike museums in Australia that have state or federal funding, we deaccession, we sell works of art regularly in order to fuel yeah. new acquisitions. And we even entered, in 1949, we entered into an agreement with the Metropolitan oh. Museum, which is, where we would transfer any masterpiece in our collection that was 50 years old or more to the Met on a regular yeah. basis, and they, in turn, <laughs> would give us funding to keep buying in, in, in the future. That project lasted for two years until somebody woke up and said among our trustees, so we put up the money, we take all the risk, we help make these works of art famous, and they get to keep them? There's just something wrong with this picture. Uh, and I remember when I arrived at the Museum of Modern Art, 
1995, I got a call from Philippe de Montebello, who is one of our great colleagues and, and was a mentor, is a mentor of mine. And Philippe said, so Glenn, great that you're at the Museum of Modern Art. By the way, we would love the Van Gogh drawings that we were promised by Andy Aldrich Rockefeller. Do you think you could deliver them now? And I said, what are you talking about? <laughs> I mean, I really had no clue. He said, oh, I think you better go and look at the records. What happened is, she was one of the founders of the museum. She was part of the agreement to do this transfer in 1949. She had the bad fortune of having died before 1951. So guess what happened? Her will said, you know, after 50 years, yeah. Yeah. The, her beautiful Van Gogh drawings would go off to the Met. Uh, and I couldn't find a way to say, you know, she was mistaken. She didn't really mean it. So they got our great uh, Van Gogh drawings. But the point about that is the Museum of Modern Art has struggled from its beginning with the problem of how to discharge its past mm, yeah. in order to remain absolutely in the in present. The present. Right. And we are still struggling yeah. with that problem. So when I got to the museum, the big debate had been, why would you keep collecting contemporary art? You don't really need it. You have such a great collection of modern art from Cezanne and Van Gogh through, let's say, Jasper Johns, or two Jasper Johns. And I started thinking about it and thought, you know, Barr got it right. It isn't about Cezanne and Van Gogh. It's about Jasper Johns and Andy Warhol and a whole lot of artists we haven't even heard about. We need to commit ourselves to the future, not to the past. Because if we're going to commit ourselves to the past, we become a historical institution. And we can never compete with a place like the Met if we're a historical institution. Because their purview is much larger and more extensive than ours could ever be. So what we've tried to do is commit to the, to the future by focusing on contemporary art and looking at our historical collections through the lens of the present, which is something we can do that's different than a place like the Met which has to look at the present through the lens of the past. It's, it's a dilemma that the institutions here will find very hard to deal with because it means shedding part of their tradition and their history, which is going to be a very difficult thing to do. Well, if you, the moment, we don't want to be historical. No. Right? And so that's the trick. How do you stay a anachronic? How do you avoid being uh, uh, historical? Anyway, the growth of the art museum has got a great future. Yes. That's, that's the important thing. <laughs> can I tell you a funny thing? Can I give you a great, great anecdote on that? Come on. Just you've got me talking now. So the art museum has a great future. Yeah. So of course, if you read all the critics in the literature, you know that the art museum is dead. Uh, it's yeah, finished. Yeah, yeah. The technology is going to replace it. And I was at a conference, um, a retreat, actually, at my college. Uh, I went to a little college in New England, and we had a retreat at Exeter College at Oxford because we have a, a relationship with them. And we had invited this incredible management guru, sort of the, the genius about disruption and change, uh, to address us. And he gave this long spiel about how technology was going to explode the, new, uh, the university, that classrooms were going to disappear, that it was all about distance. So, you know, the whole thing. This kind of management consulting has been around for about 75 years. And, uh, she said, oh, that's great. Now, now tell me about your particular business. How long have you been in business? And he said, eh, about 25 years. She said, fascinating. You know, you're standing in a room that has been in continuous use as a university since 1325. And when you have some 700 years experience behind you, I'd be really interested in your observations about how obsolete we're about to become. Yeah. Yeah. Come back in seven centuries and we'll listen to you. On that note, thanks. Thank you.